like to take the time to thank everyone here this morning for being here. And if you're a visitor for the first time, uh, we want you to know that we appreciate you being here with us this morning. You are very encouraging to us, and we hope you can come back at your next opportunity. Appreciate Cal leading the song that go along with the lesson this morning, and I'll be speaking on the lesson of worship. And uh, as mentioned this morning, uh, I'm filling in for our preacher who's out of town uh, this week, Brother Hardesty. So I'll be up here, be up here this morning. By nature, man is a worshiping being. By that, I mean that everyone everywhere pays pays homage to or pay respect to something or someone. But the question is, are they worshiping the one and only true God? And if so, are they worshiping him in spirit and in truth? If our worship is not right, then God will not accept it. We have a perfect example over in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. When the sons of Aaron, Nabot, Nadab, and Abihu offered up strange fire before God, which they were not commanded to, and God destroyed them. God would not do what he did to Nadab and Abihu if we do not properly worship him in our worship today. But God has set aside a day of judgment, which he would judge the world one day. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, and Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Man has often worshipped unscripturally throughout history, and even today people still worshipping the, the wrong objects as gods such as Buddha, the sun, and even objects of the Virgin Mary. Some of the occult even sacrifice animals. They passed a bill in Florida several years ago to allow such groups to sacrifice animals all in the name of religion. Paul, when he passed through the city of Athens, found that people worshipped idols and said, God does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth anything, since he gives to life all breath and all things. Acts 17, verses 22 through 25. At this time, I'd like to read Psalms 115, verses 2 through 8. Psalms 115, verses 2 through 8, concerning idols. The psalmist says, why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouth, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusted in them. Verse 8 sums it all up concerning those who worship and serve false God. It says, they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusted in them. The Bible clearly points out that there is only one God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 35 and 39, Moses said to the people, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. Verse 39 says, Therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart, that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 39, it says, Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 22. David wrote, Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you. Nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Also, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Ephesians 4, 6, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says there is only one God. Since God created us and therefore knows what is best for us, why would anyone worship anything or anyone else? 
In Matthew chapter 4, Satan tried to get Jesus to worship him, having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The devil made an attempt on the Son of God, assuming that Jesus would be weak, and therefore making it much easier for him to tempt Jesus to persuade our Lord to worship him. After all, Jesus went without food for 40 days and 40 nights. Anyone going without food for that long, you would think they must be starving. It's hard for us to go without food for hours, not to even mention days. Our Lord may have been weak physically, but not spiritually. Because Jesus told Satan after his third attempt to worship him, said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And the devil left him. Some of our denominational friends say that the apostle Peter was the first pope. Because Cornelius fell down his feet to worship him over in Acts chapter 10, verses 25 and verse 26. But Peter took him up and said, stand up, I myself also am a man. We are not to fall down and worship anything or anyone. Only God deserves such honor, not man. If you would, turn over to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, and I'd like to read verses 6 through 9. That's Revelation 22, verses 6 through 9. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his service as things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets and those who keep the words of this book, worship God. My friends, we do not worship man, nor idols, nor even angels but only the God and creator of our Father and of us who serves us all. In our worship, every first day of the week, we have prayer, we sing, we partake of the Lord's Supper, we lay by in store or giving as we have been proper, has been prospered, and preaching or teaching. All ought to be done in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. One can only worship God through Jesus Christ, for Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, No man cometh unto the Father except through me. Anyone making an attempt to worship God without first putting on Christ through baptism in Romans chapter 6 would be in vain because sin separates one from God, Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Unless one is in Christ and in the church, which is the body of Christ, then one cannot properly worship God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, and Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 and 24. When we assemble for worship, our main focus or attention should only be on worship and nothing else. We shouldn't be checking out Facebook on our cell phones or thinking about getting home in time to watch a certain TV program or anything that is outside of our worship service. God expects us to give 100% of our attention to him and nothing else. Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. As Brother Bob Cundy read this morning to us. Another part of our worship is prayer. Prayer is simply our way of communicating with God by requesting our needs and the needs of others through faith. God hears our prayers and God answers them according to his will. When we do pray, we need to ask in Jesus' name for Jesus again, said over in John 14, verse 6, that no one comes to the Father except through him. Also, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like unto them. 
For your father knows the thing that you have need of before you even ask. Another part of our worship is singing. And I love to sing, and I'm sure a lot of you do too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, Paul said, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. The Ephesian brethren were taught to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in their hearts to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. In Colossians chapter 3 and 16, it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The writer in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12 says, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. We should feel good and joyful about singing praise to God, our Father and Creator, whenever we sing. David did on many occasions. In Psalms chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, he says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. In Psalms 28, verse 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. In Psalm 63 and verse 5, he says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my soul shall praise you with joyful lips. Psalm 68, verse 3 and 4. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yes, let them rejoice exceedingly. Sing to God. Sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the cloud by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. David wrote many songs where he expressed his love, joy, and gratitude toward God. These are just a few. What is our attitude when we sing to pray, when we sing to God? Are we glad and joyful as David was? During singing, there are no special group chosen in the Lord's church to sing to God. Everyone is to sing that are able to. You don't have to have an outstanding voice to please God. As long as you give the best from your heart, then God will be pleased. Sometimes we get too critical of ourselves because we think our voices aren't good enough. But God only wants what's coming from your heart, no matter how bad it seems to be. Another part about worship is the Lord's Supper or Communion. It is observed on the first day of the week as the early Christian did over in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Not every first Sunday, not once a month or a year, but every Sunday on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Supper described over in Matthew chapter 26 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we take part in order to commemorate the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before taking of the Lord's Supper, we need to clear our minds and simply think back to the cross. When Jesus went through so much pain and suffering for our sins, you know, one can only imagine how much Jesus suffered on that cross for you and I. Even though he did not deserve it, yet he willingly laid down his life for us all. There is no greater love anywhere God allowing his only son to be sacrificed for our sins. We need to thank God each and every day and often for his awesome love, greatness, and mercy. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we should not think of it as a common meal. As Paul warned the brethren over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 through 29, and verse 34. If you would turn over there, please. And I'll be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 20 through 29, and verse 34. Therefore, when you come together to, in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, one takes to his own supper and head of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, 
that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And then verse 34. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, that you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. In verses 27 through 29, he says, Therefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink the cup in the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We need to be very careful how we've observed the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is laying by in store or giving. Just as the Lord's Supper is observed on the first day of the week, so is our giving. As pointed out to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. There is no set amount on how much you and I are to give under the New Testament. There was a percentage in the old law, which was 10% of all you own. But in the New Testament, it says to let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. When we give, it must be from the heart and not holding anything back. 2 Corinthians 9 and 6 says, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows, 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 sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. At this time, I'd like to read Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 41 through 44. And here we have a poor widow that was putting in money into the treasury. That's Mark 12, 41 through 44. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciple to himself and said to them, For surely I say to you, that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had, her whole livelihood. You know, what a truly remarkable and wonderful story about this, this poor widow. Jesus said she put in more than all who put in the treasury. Why? Well, because it was her whole livelihood. It was all she had. She gave of her heart. God wants to give our hearts and all that we do to please him. What a beautiful example of this poor widow. Another part of our worship service is preaching and teaching. Paul's charge to young Timothy over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, was to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they would not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they would turn their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables or myths. There are going to be times when some people will not be willing to hear what the speaker says from God's words, especially if it involves them. We have to be bold when it comes to defending the gospel and standing up for the truth. At this time, turn over to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, and I like to read verses 8 through to verse 20. Acts 14, 8 through 20. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. 
This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw that Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Iconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priests of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates intended to sacrifice with the multitude. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitudes, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from this useless thing to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generation allow all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful season, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these, thing, and with these things, they could scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitude, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. You know, Paul was very courageous to have been stoned. Got right back up and went back into the city where people tried to kill him. This truly is bold and very remarkable by Paul to do this. Because Paul didn't fear because he knew that he had an afterlife with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul experienced another situation where he displayed his boldness in Acts chapter 21, verses 8 through 14, when he was told not to go to Jerusalem because he would be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. Paul would respond by saying in verse 13 of chapter 21, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a perfect example of being bold and courageous by Paul. In preaching, it must be according to God's word with boldness. Jesus and his apostles did so. Finally, turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, and I like to read verses 6 through 12. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, who is not another, but there are some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have been received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? If I still please men, I would not be the servant and bond servant of Jesus Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel was preached to me is not according to me. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it from man, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. When it comes to preaching, we do not please men, only God. Is there anyone here this morning who has not rendered their obedience to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? You can change all that this morning by confessing your sins and being buried with Christ in baptism to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4 or a brother or sister may be possibly here this morning who has fallen short and need the prayers of the congregation. Verse 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If anyone has a need this morning, please come now while we stand and sing.